Well, it is, of course, a huge honour to be here um, to receive uh, uh, my honorary degree tomorrow, it, it, and it's a great pleasure to be amongst friends. So, I have a few minutes to try and amuse you. Um, I have a certain logic that I'll run through. I was given the title of my talk, which was um, Materials for the Future. And it sort of touches on, but is different to uh, what we've heard um, earlier today. Uh, the first remark to make is that um, general well-being correlates rather worryingly with energy consumption. Uh, this is a well-used slide uh, showing um, GDP per capita in sort of normalized units back to 1995, and primary energy use per capita in gigajoules. And what you see uh, is that everyone wants to be in the top right-hand corner, where the US is. Um, uh, we manage just about as well in GDP in Europe, um, using half as much energy, so we're very pleased with ourselves for that, is probably because the climate is less unpleasant. Um, um, and, and, and you can track, actually, that Russia um, was doing quite well until um, Glasnost and the collapse of the economy, and actually went backwards, and now it's going rapidly forwards, and is well on the way towards the US trajectory. Now, those who enjoy these plots um, speculate as to whether the developing world, China, uh, India, and so on, will follow the European trajectory, or if it would be sustainable, something much lower than that, um, but rather than heading up towards the US. So that's a bit of US bashing. Uh, but the point is, we use a lot of energy, and we're not going to willingly give it up. So the homework was, what is the world going to be in uh, 2053? And if I'm around, I'll be 100 then. Uh, so I possibly need to worry about it, um, having heard the talk um, on uh, uh, wonderful advances in healthcare. Um, uh, before the break. Well, I mean, a way of looking at what will be the same and what will change is just to go back and have a look at what the laws of um, science, I nearly said physics, but I'll be more general, science, um, tell us we can and can't do. Um, because in some cases, um, and I'll give you an example, uh, we're doing quite well already, but in other cases there's a huge amount of headroom. So my working presumption is that where there's a lot of headroom, where we're using energy and materials very inefficiently, uh, in 40 years' time, those will be dead technologies that will have been replaced. Now, I'm not telling you how they'll be replaced, it's just I think they will have been replaced because there's headroom. So this is a talk primarily about headroom. So let's have a look at uh, materials which we think are pretty good but have got a long way to go. Uh, Lithium-ion battery um, has about one twentieth the energy density of lighter fuel um, or kerosene, uh, which is why electric cars, um, first of all, weigh a lot, and secondly, don't go very far um, before they run out of battery. There's a huge amount of headway to go. I mean, the problem with current batteries is that very few of the atoms in the battery actually store any energy usefully. Most of it's sort of padding that isn't adding, <coughs> uh, whereas um, Kerosene is just all energy. So there's a, there's a huge amount that will happen. Lighting, I'm going to say more about that. There has been a revolution in lighting, and I want to run through that, uh, because uh, we've done a lot better. I mean, there's a big change from candles to electric light, but electric lights, the sort that the EU has um, cheerfully forbidden us from buying, um, uh, are about 10% efficient. 90% of the electricity ends up as heat rather than light. Solar cells, uh, which one day we have to do, because uh, that's uh, the only truly abundant renewable energy source, are too expensive, um, not necessarily uh, in terms of how much they cost to buy, uh, because the Chinese very nicely make them for, for us and then sell them at less than what it costs them, um, uh, but because actually the energy used to make a solar cell um, is rather large, and even if you dutifully put it up on your roof, it may have to stay, if you live so close to the North Pole, um, on your roof for five years before it's merely paid back the energy used to make it. That's um, not very good. And if you want a real example of, of something we do really badly, it's computing. Uh, just about every step in information technology is about one thousandth as good as the human brain. Um, what we do to store energy, uh, what we do to do logic elements, and what we do to communicate energy um, information is extremely inefficient. So there, there are bound to be huge changes. So memory is not going to be dynamic RAM. It's going to be not uh, non-volatile. I'm not sure what it's going to be. That's just a certainty. It will happen long before 2053. 
So there are some examples of things which are definitely going to change. I mean, if I'm not around in 2053, it doesn't matter if I'm wrong. Um, but, but, but on the other hand, there are plenty of examples of things which are not going to change much. And I, I'm sticking my uh, neck out here, and I didn't check to see whether people at this university work on this topic. And you, so uh, apologies if I've offended anybody in the back. Um, but aviation, um, as, a, as an example of transport, um, is working pretty well. Um, you, we can do better. We, um, we love the, uh, the 787, the Dreamliner, uh, once they've sorted out the lithium batteries that tend to catch fire. Um, uh, and what that has done is to improve fuel efficiency by 15%. This is not a factor of 10 or a factor of 1,000, which is the real gains um, that are there in other areas of technology. And it's done that by dropping weight and making the engines a bit more efficient. And we will carry on being able to do that a bit. But there's some fundamental limits um, to what we can do. Kerosene is the highest energy density fuel short of nuclear fuel that we can put um, on an aircraft, certainly by volumetric efficiency. Um, hydrogen doesn't work, it's just too, um, uh, too low density. So we're going to carry on using kerosene, and the limit to how far you can fly uh, depends on what fraction of your takeoff weight you're prepared to use as fuel. Um, and that's just fixed by the laws of physics. It's very, very elegantly illustrated by one of my colleagues in Cambridge, David Mackay, who is the uh, government um, uh, science advisor to the Department for Energy and Climate Change at the moment. Uh, he has a wonderful book, which I'm, I'm doing a bit of sales. Uh, it's called um, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. It's free to download. Um, I do recommend you read it. He does a wonderful analysis of the energy involved in flight. Um, and it is his statement that the limit to range is set by fuel weight fraction. So he has a lovely example. Uh, this is the bar-tailed godwit, um, which does an annual migration from Alaska to New Zealand non-stop. It's the longest migration in the animal kingdom. It's about matches a 747. And in both cases, when they take off, about 40% of their weight is hydrocarbon fuel which is burnt before they land again. Same physics, that's as far as nature has got. I bet aviation doesn't do a lot better by 2053. Now, I picked on avi aviation. There are other examples, too. I'm just trying to illustrate that one can pick one's way through to see uh, where materials are used quite well, which is actually the case in aviation, or where there's a long way to go. So, I thought I would, oh, and I, I, I said I would talk about lighting. Yes, I'm forgetting what I've got on my slides. Um, gallium nitride light emitting diodes, um, that, that together with some phosphors that reduce the super bright white um, cycle lamps that can dazzle oncoming motorists that have improved um, the survival chances of cyclists, um, are incredibly efficient. Um, that in units of lumens per watt, uh, incandescent lamps, that's tungsten light bulbs, say about 15 lumens per watt, uh, the uh, Department of Energy in the U.S. is targeting 200 lumens per watt. Vast improvement. This is towards sort of 50% and more than 50% of the electrical energy going in coming out as useful light. Wonderful, unexpected discovery by Nakamura, discovering how it was possible to do the bit that people hadn't been able to do to make gallium nitride LEDs really work well. Huge improvement in energy efficiency. Uh, so everything should be better. Uh, but then once reminded of Jevons paradox, uh, Jevons in the, about 1865 uh, was, was noted that the improvement and efficiency of steam engines in England was going fantastically well, uh, but rather surprisingly the consumption of coal was going up rather than down, uh, and that reason of course is that steam engines were so good that people wanted more of them. Now in the case of lighting, um, uh, the, the improvement in efficiency over the last 150 years, that sort of pre gallium nitride, is about a factor of 100, but global consumption of light has gone up by a factor of 10,000. So overall power consumption, or energy consumption, has gone up by a factor of 100. Now you could say, and I would say, that's been to the enormous benefit um, of the quality of life um, around um, the globe. But it is a big problem that efficiency of its own right does not lower power consumption, energy consumption. It generates more demand. 
So I will briefly say a little bit about the things that I've been involved with, and I've, I have colleagues um, in this university who, are, um, who have a wonderful program of research going back many years in this field too. And we've been, uh, and the reason I'm going to pick this example is that I've given you a sort of, um, not exactly proof, but a sort of illustration of where I think it's possible that things will go forward, but precisely what material system turns out to do something wonderful is unpredictable. That's going to come from almost anywhere, um, but usually not where some funding agency has decided where it should, because um, science is more interesting than that. Um, so we, we've been working on essentially carbon-based molecules or long molecules, which we call polymers, which are rather similar to, the, to anything that nature, biology, plants um, uh, choose to make coloured. So the way light um, reacts with our materials is very much like uh, the pigments in photosynthesis. Um, and there are some of them that we can, I mean, here are some different materials, they've different, got different colours, um, and they're very fluorescent. Um, and they, if, if they're treated, if they're designed properly, they behave a bit like silicon, but they're like fluorescent paint as well. So it's the option of throwing away the extremely uh, energy intensive methods of making silicon crystals, slicing into wafers, making chips, and so on, which is fine for, for, for small bits for uh, very high power computing, but not much use if you want to coat uh, the world with solar cells. Um, <clears throat> So uh, we, we had a lucky break um, a bit more than 20 years ago. We discovered we could make light emitting diodes out of these polymers. Um, they weren't very bright. If you, that little sort of stripe there um, is a little stripe of light coming up from an early device uh, inside a brass can, which was evacuated because these things didn't like um, uh, oxygen very much. Uh, but it was, if you want to get something published in nature, it may be very difficult, but the device doesn't need to last for more than a few minutes. Um, it has to do much better than that if you want to sell it. Um, so, um, and as modern professors do, um, we founded a company which has sort of survived. Um, and organic LEDs, with uh, of course huge technology, substantially developed in Asia, um, and some scientific inputs very importantly from Kodak in the USA. Um, it, it has, it's sort of emerging quite rapidly as, a tech, as an important technology. If you have a Samsung smartphone, uh, you're staring at a few million organic light emitting diodes. That's molecules similar to those that biology makes, being energized as, in, as semiconductors in the way that silicon works. Uh, so there's some spectacular um, TV sets, 56 inch diagonal, 4K resolution, um, used based on the Cambridge uh, jet printed technology that Panasonic showed in January in Las Vegas. And really surprisingly, these things are so efficient now that they are the best option for interior lighting, where one can make panels rather than point sources. So the world's lighting companies, Philips in Europe for example, um, see this technology um, as pretty important. So that has sort of come from curiosity to significant technology um, and likely to go much further. Uh, where it may go um, is producing really efficient solar cells. Um, so the proposition with a solar cell uh, is that we've got to do better than a leaf. And the characteristic of a leaf, certainly a deciduous leaf, is that somewhere, um, I mean ordinarily it would be um, sort of mid-May, but this year it's sort of late May or June, comes, um, <laughs> comes into, um, you know, grows. Um, and it's got to make um, a, a positive return on investment um, pretty quickly, otherwise the plant will die. It's probably got a month or a month and a half uh, where it's got to photosynthesize more stuff than was used to grow it in the first place. So that's a payback time of, say, two months. Silicon solar cells we measure in several years. So how do you do that? We have to make them with less stuff. Um, if you make something that is smaller, uh, um, it loses less energy, it's got just thinner substrates, then yes, maybe we can do that. So there's a lot, a lot of groups that are trying. Efficiencies are quite good. They're up to 10%, 12% actually, which is slightly out of date. And the plan is that we can start with rolls of plastic foil and add all the bits needed by printing to make rolls of solar cell. It's a very cheap manufacturing process. The materials are not cheap enough and the performance isn't quite good enough, but that will come. But the exciting option is that it actually uses very little material. So in that sense, it's much more like a leaf than silicon. 
So uh, we um, in Cambridge uh, tried to get a company going on this, which we succeeded with. And then we discovered, um, I mean, it's lovely doing technology push. Um, it's one of the privileges we have in the universities. Uh, but that is not the same thing as finding customers. And customers in the area of renewable energy are extremely hard to find. Um, and even when they can be found, they're very fickle because governments keep changing um, subsidies um, and that can wreck a, a budding industry. So we look very hard to find where there is an, unsub an unsubsidized market where um, uh, there's a huge latent demand. Um, and I know it's rather trendy, it turns out to be Africa and the off-grid world. Um, it turns out that uh, the real cost of electricity um, or whatever is used to, the energy used to produce light in Africa is vastly higher than grid electricity uh, because they burn kerosene. A uh, typical um, household in Kenya spends two US dollars a week on kerosene. Um, and we can provide a solar cell, a battery, and some LED lights that are rented to them for one dollar a week and make a profit. Um, so that's the proposition, but the catch is, and, and this is, I'm wandering back away from science to uh, like economics and social issues, the catch is that it costs quite a lot to buy it up front, and that's what always restricts penetration into emerging markets. People do not have savings, they can pay rent, so they have to rent. Uh, and the proof that that can work in what we regard as poor economies is that there are 750 million mobile phones, cell phones, owned by people with no grid electricity. And of course, they don't own them, they rent them. So uh, we found a clever way where, uh, to unlock our wonderful box um, every week. Uh, you need to get a code, which you do by exchanging a text message with us, because uh, of course, all these people have got cell phones. Um, and it's, uh, this is a wonderful journey away from science, so it's the pleasure of, of um, wandering into the real world. But I illustrate that um, as an example of just how complex these, what apparently attractive technology solutions uh, turn out to be when you want to put them into the market. Um, and uh, my, my view at the moment is that uh, Africa is wonderfully um, unsubsidized and quite close to a real market and um, Europe is an absolute disaster. Thank you. Thank you.